Hi. Good afternoon. It's really a special pleasure for me today to be able to introduce Craig Mundy to all of you. Craig is here as, under the auspices of the Gordon Grand Lecture Series, which was set up about 40 years ago. Uh, actually, interesting story, Gordon Grand was a very distinguished alumnus of Yale College who went on to be a business leader at the Olin Corporation and other enterprises. Um, and in his memory, his classmate, Clint Frank, how many people recognize who Clint Frank was? Anybody? He was Yale's Heisman Trophy winner in 1937. Um, uh, Clint, Clint Frank gave a gift to endow the Gordon Grant lectureship, and uh, we've had, for that entire period of time, outstanding business leaders come to Yale to talk to Yale College students. When the School of Management opened, later in the 1970s, the program was expanded so that usually we can tap these visitors to go to both, to speak to both Yale College students and to um, SOM students. Anyway, Craig Mundy, I had the great pleasure in, uh, I guess we both did, in January 2009, of being appointed by President Obama to the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, where there are some real scientists and real technologists and a token economist. And um, I, I, have, I have learned so much from Craig through his participation in, this, in, in those meetings. He's uh, got an extraordinary grasp of the whole range of what technology can do for the human condition. I'll come back to that. Craig's history is that he spent a number of years after graduating from Georgia Tech in the computer industry in a variety of startup businesses uh, uh, and uh, some bigger ones. Uh, and then in 1993, uh, he moved to uh, Microsoft where he's been the last 20 years and where his role has been quite extraordinary for many years. Um, uh, up till just recently, he was the chief strategy, th chief research and strategy officer for this technological giant, uh, direct <coughs> directing the entirety of Microsoft's research organization, and also uh, the, ch the chief strategist in technology and 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 uh, how you know the, pro the approach the company should take towards the uh, development of new technologies. He also wore this simultaneously that. Uh, the role of being uh, Microsoft's chief liaison to major to foreign governments when they were entering foreign markets, and to and and, and indeed in Washington uh, as technology policies were being considered there. He's uh, he's recently gone into a kind of phased retirement where he's going to be uh, where he's passed on the the large management role that he had before, and now he's serving as senior advisor to Steve Ballmer. But here's a man who's been close to Bill Gates first, and then Steve Ballmer as the uh, in over the last 20 years and has had a lot to do with the shaping of one of America's great companies. Um, Craig, uh, Craig has an, um, an astonishing grasp of t emerging technologies and that's what he's going to talk about today. But, uh, and I'm sure he will want to welcome questions in any area that he talks about. But frankly, you can quiz him on just about anything because any area of technology that where technology intersects policy or changes in you know, human life, he's, he knows something about it. It's quite remarkable. He's got great interest in, in, uh, in uh, the sort of use of, te of technology in, in biomedicine. And he, one of the signal contributions he made to the President's uh, commi uh, commi Council of Advisors was in his leadership on our report on healthcare IT, where he essentially conceptualized a whole new architecture for keeping electronic health records that is really a generation ahead of where we are now and has provided very important policy guidance as we think about the future of healthcare IT. So it's just a great pleasure to introduce a great friend, a, a great colleague, and a real leader of technology and business strategy, Craig Mundy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. It's very kind of you. <laughs> Thank you for such an elaborate introduction. It's a pleasure to be at Yale. Uh, we had originally planned to do this a few months ago, and, and uh, the giant storm forced us to cancel it at the last minute. Uh, but I was committed to coming here and, and uh, sort of uh, completing that, that goal that we had of talking here. These discussions on uh, college campuses are something that Bill Gates and I, for 20 years that I've known him and worked with him, we both have really cherished these opportunities. And each year, uh, 
that Bill was at Microsoft, and in the time since he's left, you know, I've sort of uh, continued what was my own commitment to spending about a week a year in the United States visiting four, sometimes five uh, universities and giving a talk like this. But uh, I also spend time, I have a round table with students, a round table with the faculty, a round table with the administration, and uh, with Rick's help, you know, we were able to arrange all those today and it's been uh, a fantastic experience. Part of the goal in doing these talks is to not only share with you a little bit of some of what we think is going to happen that you might find interesting, uh, particularly you know, more and more as technology is so pervasive in its influence on our, our lives and, and our work and, and ultimately our societies. Uh, but it's also a chance for old guys like me to get grounded you know, uh, in, in what's happening with young people and what, what uh, sort of the fresh thinking is that happens uh, largely in university campuses. And, um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a two-way transaction. Uh, today, I'll spend about the first 45 minutes or so and give you some uh, ideas and demonstrations of some technology that we're working on now. Uh, by and large, almost everything I'll show you is not a shipping product. It's mostly derived from work in our research groups. Uh, that's not in the far future, but in the relatively near future. Uh, and so we'll keep our fingers crossed that, that all of these prototype systems actually work right. Uh, but I think, you know, people uh, like the people at Yale would certainly be pretty familiar with what you can actually buy today and what you can do with it. At least that's my operating assumption. And so I think the value add is to tell you what some of the major things are from a trending point of view and, and what the technology is that's going to help you to realize some benefit from those things. After that talk, uh, we'll actually give away some of the door prizes in case any of you have to actually leave for another commitment sort of on the hour. But then I'm going to stay uh, at least until 5.30 and have an open Q&A. And as Rick said, you know, basically there, there's no real rules. You can, you can ask me anything about any topic and if I any, have anything to offer that's worthwhile, uh, I'll, I'll offer it. Uh, so it doesn't have to be confined to the technology I talk about or Microsoft or anything else. I'm happy to just uh, have a discussion with people. Uh, and then I guess we're going to have free pizza after that. So <laughs> uh, for those who want to stay, you get fed too. The, uh, so let me start first and, and talk about you know, how our own business is evolving. Microsoft for many years has been known primarily for Windows and Office, you could say, although uh, if you really look at it, the company is, is, is a very huge and diverse enterprise these days. You know, we have about 93,000 people, uh, about 45,000 engineers, uh, and we build products across the entire range from game consoles and, and uh, you know, high-tech gaming capabilities and, and content, you know, at the other end uh, to, to critical infrastructure components for enterprises and governments. And so I think, you know, as a company, it gives us a perspective uh, across everything that, that software and computing gets applied to that, that's pretty broad. Uh, also, we're very, I would argue, one of the world's most uh, globalized businesses. I think last count was like 201 countries that the company actually operates in. And so, you know, we uh, end up having to deal with a lot of the things that are uh, imposed on companies simply because of the diversity in, in the planet uh, and, and its people that we, we ultimately deal with. Um, but there is a big change afoot in, in our world over the last few years. Uh, many of these are things we've anticipated. We didn't always do a great job in execution, but it wasn't for lack of understanding them. Uh, and that's the emergence of many, many devices uh, and all of them being computerized and increasingly all of them getting connected. Uh, in fact, when Bill Gates and, at the time, Nathan Mirvold uh, hired me at Microsoft, it was to do startups, and the first startups were to focus on how to think about creating a system for when, when all these devices would become computerized. And so we've been working on interactive television and game consoles and watches and cars and televisions literally since I went there in 1992. Uh, and many of these things have now come to market in our big businesses, and and some of them, like interactive television, are still in the birthing process. Uh, and it just shows that when you are actually trying to change society's infrastructure, it takes a long time and it takes a huge investment. So merely having the technology or the insight about how it might be applied, you know, still requires that you, you think carefully about how these things ultimately are going to get uh, deployed. And, uh, and there are many 
uh, interesting challenges. As Rick indicated, you know, one of those challenges is that many of these things are now in regulated industries. And while much of the computer industry was born in an environment where we didn't really think much about regulation, you know, when you start to let this seep into virtually every form of critical infrastructure and, and operating environment that, that the world has, uh, you're inevitably going to face a lot more regulation and that, that affects you know, how you do the business and, and how you think about the products. And it was that that really originally uh, forced me to get involved in, in all of these diplomatic activities for the company. The other thing that's really changed is once everything got connected, you know, we have evolved to where there's almost no device or application that we think about in isolation, either from the other devices in the family of devices uh, or from the services that exist in the backbone of the Internet uh, and which essentially help to empower these things. And yet, they're all derived from software uh, and computing in one form or another. And so, you know, we're going through, I think, the sixth or seventh major evolution in 38 years of, of the way we think about our business, uh, to not think about it so much as just building software as uh, a, a component that we ship to other people uh, and that you buy on a perpetual use license basis, but rather that we People uh, want to buy these things more from us as a, as a, uh, as a service, something that, that we curate and operate and that they can buy on a usage-based model. And so we're changing a lot of how Microsoft not only builds its products, but even how we think about monetizing the software capabilities that we have in the future. Now, one of the things that has obviously been valuable uh, so far has been you know, the graphical user interface. And almost everybody today thinks of that as, you know, the innate or, or, or basic way in which they tend to operate computers. For a long time, you operated that with uh, pointing and clicking and typing as the way to do it. And, uh, you know, in the last six, seven years, it's really exploded uh, in terms of how people have sought to use touch and and ultimately other forms of human sense-like capabilities as an alternative way to drive that graphical interface. Uh, but one of the things I'll talk about uh, later in this, in this talk is a major focus at Microsoft, which has been around the idea of what we call natural user interface, or NUI, to replace or, or supplement GUI. And natural in the sense that we want it to emulate the way people uh, interact with other people. We'd really like the computer to be more like us, uh, and we'd like to, to find a, a situation where through that, many more people can get much greater utility from computing capability than even that which has been achieved so far. You know, if you look today, there's arguably maybe about two billion of the seven billion people who really benefit from computers, and so there's more who haven't yet had that you know, benefit than who have already enjoyed it. And of course, it's this question of utilization and the skills necessary to, to use computing that, that in many ways, along with cost, has been a limiter. Uh, but today, you know, the high volume of these things has continued to drive the cost down. And in fact, you can uh, go almost anywhere in the world, in the poorest places even, and you know, you'll start to find uh, you know, televisions and cell phones. And I think that, you know, there's no reason to believe in the future that any, any person anywhere in the world who can afford to buy a television or a cell phone won't in the process, in the bargain, be buying a computer system and probably some type of, of uh, inherent connectivity. And with that, you know, we can really think about how computing then provides a much different range of benefits for, for all those people. So, uh, Touch has been an important change. You know, this last version of Windows that we developed, uh, Windows 8, was one, really the first time where the company elevated touch-based operation to sort of a first-class citizen uh, status. And, you know, we uh, brought with OEMs and by ourselves these Surface products uh, or, or Windows 8-based tablets to market. But we tend to believe that over time <coughs> we're going to see uh, all sizes of these uh, types of, of touch-based displays and that they're going to find many applications beyond that which we historically have known. Uh, so I brought 
this, which is a, a new product from Microsoft, uh, which is basically, uh, I'll say it's the second largest tablet that we sell. Uh, this one's 55 inches. Uh, and actually, we, we currently sell one that's 82 inches. And uh, in fact, it is exactly the same interface and, and you know, model of operation that you have on a, any standard Windows 8 tablet. And so you know, we're, we're beginning to find that when you take this model, and everybody has sort of focused so much on mobility, you know, the cell phone and the, and the small tablet, and while that's important and powerful, you know, our belief is that, that largely through the cost reductions that have been driven by, uh, by t television sales around the world, and ultimately even uh, the, the emergence of projectors, you know, like the one that drives that thing to well over 100 inches of, of display capability, uh, these things have just continued to plummet in price. And so even without assuming there's any radical breakthroughs in technology, we find it completely plausible to believe that you, know, you should think that there will be a continuum of screen sizes that will be ultimately touch and gesture enabled and they'll range from the very small, probably as small as, as your watch perhaps, you know, up to the very large, uh, certainly which will be wall sized in your office. So inside Microsoft, you know, we, we've actually started to deploy these things, you know, not completely broadly yet because we're still sort of driving the cost out of them. Uh, but those who have them, including our CEO, uh, find that having it in your office is sort of transformational in the way that you think about doing meetings uh, and, and how you interact with other people. You know, in a university environment, uh, certainly my experience was, you know, you, you, you sit and talk to a lot of people, you're trying to work on a problem. It's almost hard to do it without either having a shared piece of paper or frequently a chalkboard or a whiteboard. And there's just something powerful about that ability to have this kind of shared experience. And, and we share that dream in a powerful way. And so by being able to put these things you know, almost on any surface in the future, you know, you start to really think of how a computer-mediated form of that type of interaction becomes possible. Uh, the other thing that's happening is that as computers just get increasingly potent, uh, we start to think about doing applications in radically different ways. So I'm going to show you one of my sort of personal favorites. I, I personally sponsored the beginning of this work in our sort of research and incubation area, uh, I guess six or seven years ago. And it, it's now actually ships as a product called Fresh Paint. And I don't know if any of you have seen this, but you know, if you uh, look at it, I mean, th these are you know, things that you can now you know, buy uh, as little sort of like paint books for, like you buy for your kids. Let me just first show you a little bit about what's interesting about this. You say, oh, hey, I've seen paint you know, on my computer. Uh, but you've never really seen paint probably like this, because what this thing actually is, is a full-on physics simulation of painting. And so uh, the paper, including its texture, it has a 3D you know, uh, model of the, of the paper. Uh, the, the different art mediums, in this case oil paint, uh, crayons, and, and, uh, and pencil, you know, are actually all modeled physically. And the interaction, including of, of the brushes, which are kind of indicated here, including the movement of the bristles and the twisting of them, and are all done with physics simulations. And so in this case, you know, uh, you know if I pick any color uh, and, and any brush and change you know, the line width or whatever it is, then you know, what I've got is an uh, ability to to, you know, just paint with my finger or with a brush. So you have a capacitive brush with the real bristles. And so more and more there's this direct coupling between sort of the virtual world and the physical world, and we're able to model more and more of it. And you say, well, that's nice, dummy, but that's the wrong color for Yale, and we don't make the A that way. <laughs> and uh, so I say, okay, well, you know, what else can we do to help me? since I'm not a very good artist. So I can say, well, in here, somebody actually uh, helped me out, and they took a, a Yale logo and stuck it in here. And, you know, it has uh, 
we'll say we're going to use this nice fat brush because I'll be in a hurry. And uh, I'll show you one other thing. It, this is now si this is simulating blue oil paint. Now, when this thing was done, th this started and assumed the outline was actually in black. And oil paint dries slowly. And so if I actually start to paint in this thing, uh, you'll see as I go across the lines, the blue paint mixes with the black paint because it wasn't dry. And, but if I say, well, I didn't really want that, I'm in a hurry. The nice thing about digital oil paint is I have this little fan, and if I turn the fan on, it dries instantly. <laughs> and so, you know, now I can paint and no mixing of the blue and the black. And this thing, in, in the, the whole art, in the, in, the, in the app store for Windows now, this is, I think, either the first or second most popular application. And it really shows how when you give a high quality tool to people, whether it's for the kids, uh, or it turns out for people who are professional artists who are trying to figure out what is the future of the art you know, business. So at Yale, I mean, I assume everybody's doing this already. But the, uh, you know, how, what's it going to be when you want to preserve the classical uh, concept of, of oil-based painting, and yet you want to, you know, at least practice or learn or be able to have these kind of digital tools to do it. The really, really wonderful part about this is not only can you dry the paint, but if you make a mistake, you can take it off. <laughs> and so if you think about this for training kids, you know, it's unbelievable because there's no mess, <laughs> you know. They, they, de they develop a fearlessness, which of course is characteristic of young people, but it's really hard in art, you know, because you make a mistake, you trash the whole thing, you crumple it up, start over again. Here, the rate at which people can learn, it turns out to be quite accelerated because, you know, you basically can correct errors instantaneously. And so uh, now, you know, we see all kinds of these interesting things happening where, uh, for example, we, we went and we wanted to create a thing, so we actually went to, to Disney and said, hey, we want to license old Nemo uh, so that kids can paint Nemo. And the thing that was remarkable, they said, sure, you don't have to do that. And then we showed this thing to their animators. And the animators became so intrigued with the whole thing that they ended up creating a whole custom set of Nemo characters, you know, just specifically to be able to be painted on this medium. And I, I just think we're going to see a lot more of that very, uh, very clever kind of interaction in the future. And, you know, who knows where it'll end up. Uh, one of the more challenging things that, that we intend to do, but ha it's not in this product, uh, but uh, we think we know how to do it now, is to do watercolors, uh, including all the diffusion, you know, and mixing that happens in the, in the papers. And so, you know, the, when you realize it, I mean, it, the, the amount of computing that is going on in, able, in order to be able to do this is, is really stunning. Uh, and yet, you know, it's going to be available to anybody on a tablet for a couple of hundred bucks. And I think that that's going to be quite remarkable. The next thing I want to talk a little bit about is, is big data. You hear a lot about it. You know, you can hear de different definitions of what it might mean. You know, some people talk about the, the three V's, you know, variety, velocity, and volume as somehow indicators that your data is big. Uh, in practical terms, for us, it really has me meant you've got so much data that you can't get a sort of practical insight out of it in any reasonable amount of time from even the largest single machine. And, and so we've been building these really super scale facilities, in many cases just to allow us to build and operate these internet, way, internet scale services. And what's happening more and more is we're taking the architectures of those machines and adjusting them in ways that allow us to not only ingest but then to process uh, these really staggering amounts of, of data that are being created. And the data is flowing from all different sources. It's not you know, tr traditionally just the stuff that, that humans input directly or as a byproduct of doing transactions. 
you know, we're living in a sensor-driven world. You know, every cell phone you carry around, you know, uh, you know, maybe some of you have, you know, I have the Fitbit, you know, which basically is a sensor pack in your pocket that keeps track of your, your movement, stair climbing, you know, activity levels, sleep. Uh, you know, so more and more I think people are going to live an instrumented life, and that'll all get, you know, plugged into this environment. There's all the classical, you know, big data sets like things that, that Rick and I worked on in the healthcare area for President Obama. Uh, and, and as these come together, our ability to learn new things from them uh, represent a real chance for breakthroughs in both cost and efficacy of our healthcare. But there's two different ways that we've thought about how to get value out of this big data and that we employ uh, initially inside Microsoft for quite a few years and increasingly you know, will be made available uh, as products for other people to use too. One of these is sort of to build on the continuing uh, trend in, in visualization, which depends on, you know, using some type of graphical system typically to couple human insight, you know, into the problem. And, you know, that's a powerful tool and, and we think in the big data world, uh, the ability to do that can be made even better. Uh, the other one, and I'll talk about that more in a minute, is machine learning. Uh, you know, this is something that many of us in computer science have pursued for decades. Uh, but I think in the last few years, we've really made some breakthroughs, in part because of the scale of the machines that we have to operate on. <coughs> and ironically, in part because of the volume of the data sets that we have to operate on with those big machines. And we're actually starting to find that many of the problems that we had in some classes of machine learning were really just the fact that you know, we were sort of on the right path a long time ago and gave up on it too early simply because we didn't have enough data to feed it and a big enough machine to crunch it. And when you do, you find out that you can actually uh, solve some of these problems. So the next uh, thing I want to show you is, uh, it came out of Microsoft Research uh, very recently, and it's called uh, in internally Sketch Insight. And when you start to make the assumption that you have tablets, big and small, on all kinds of surfaces, and you want to use them for this type of collaborative discussion or presentation, then you want the same kind of naturalness that you get out of uh, using a chalkboard. But again, you know, why shouldn't you get more help from the computer? So here, this one uses, you know, this has a pen. So unlike just a, a normal touch thing that many people use, these systems are quite different in that they also support a very high resolution pen. And so, you know, it really is like having, uh, you know, a, a, a pen or pencil that you can write on these things with. It's not, you know, finger width drawing. Um, and so this one, we've loaded a few different uh, data sets in, and the one I'm going to demonstrate has some population dynamics in terms of the global population. Now, so it's been taught a few gestures. So the first gesture, uh, hopefully, is this one. And as soon as it recognizes it, it sort of straightens it out and says, OK, what that is, he wants to have a graph. And make it a little easier, I'll, I'll stretch this out for now and uh, move it over. And in this graph, uh, I, wanna, I want this to be population versus uh, year. So if I start to write population here, it says, oh, OK, well, I only know a couple things. In this case, one thing that's in the data set, and if, if you want population. So yeah, I don't have to write the rest of it. I'll put it in there for you. Right, and then the same thing goes for year. So if I go down here and I start to type year, it recognizes that, says, okay, yeah, year, I want year. So then it goes and extracts all the data and hooks it up. And you can say, well, gee, I, uh, I don't know what, do I like that data or not? Well, maybe I want to have a, um, a uh, bar graph. So I, I can say, you know, make the thing into a bar graph. So it'll redo that. Uh, I can say, no, I really think I'd rather have a line graph. So I'll just say, you know, maybe I can make a line graph out of it. And I say, I, I don't want all those individual points. What I want is a sum. So it sums them all up. And what I really want to know is not just the, the global population, which from 1960 to 2010 went from 3 billion to 7 billion. I want to know what it looks like by continent. So yeah, it knows about continents. So it splits it all out and puts it in continent form. And, but then, you know, it do other interesting things. So I'll shrink this back here a little bit. And 
says, okay, I also know how to make other graphs. So how about a pie chart, uh, which is by year versus uh, population. And now it turns out that these all get linked. So these turn out to become controls for the data on this side. So you know, if I turn off the red one, it turns off 1960. And if I turn it on. So now I've got it, suddenly made myself an interactive tool you know, that allows me to explore uh, different parts. Now it knows how to make you know, other graphs too. And so it has this inverted gesture. Uh, knows how to do, do uh, geoplotting, you know, maps. So now I've got a map, and th this map is color-coded to match that thing, and it also becomes a vehicle for controlling this. So if I say, hey, I really don't want to look at all this data, I, you know, I only want to look at uh, Eurasia and North America. So I turn all them off, and then I only get that data. And so suddenly, you know, you've, you're doing all this interactively, you've got this huge data set you know, behind you, uh, and yet y you come up with this very, very simple way to make the presentation. You can then record all these things, you can play them back. And so the whole idea of how you make a presentation, how you give a presentation, how you collaborate, you know, all will evolve over time. So let me uh, go on and talk a little bit more about the way that we think that this collaborative type of, uh, of, of work is going to go we see more and more of these business intelligence type tools that we want to build. And while this, you know, gave you some assistance in trying to uh, control the sort of the drawing and the, and the linking of these, these elements, you know, we also wanted to try to build more powerful tools that allowed you to sort of see into super complex data in ways that uh, would be really hard to do otherwise. So the next one I'm going to show you is a thing called Sandance. Uh, it has the code name inside Microsoft Research. And what this is, is it's pretty much, you know, the entire U.S. Census data. And, you know, turns out it's, you know, pretty much easily stored in a single computer now. Uh, and, and it turns out if you just said, well, you know, there's, okay, there's the census data, it doesn't really make any sense, you know, as, as just a big blob uh, of all kinds of data. So now you can start to say, well, I want to assign different, you know, like colors to different things. So here's all the different things that we extracted from uh, the census. In this case, what I'm going to do is I want, to, I want to color code income, you know, from low to high, green to red. So now it goes through this thing and it starts to color code each of these census data things. This is census data at the, I think, the county level. And, you know, you can at least now start to see if you look carefully you know, at, at sort of what the general uh, income distribution is. But, you know, you can't really tell, well, where is it? But the thing has different modes. So if I actually say, what, you know, what I want you to do now is go look for l latitude, longitude data and, and plot the thing against Latin long. So now I, this isn't actually a map that got filled in. It's just the counties plotted with their latitude and longitude. And of course, what does it make? It makes a thing that looks like the United States because it's all the counties of the United States. Now, you know, you can sort of also see, you know, where the population densities are and you can see that, that basically as you get, you know, into the major cities in the, you know, wherever they are in the country, on the coasts in the middle, you know, that, that goes from red, you know, to, to the middle range. And, you get up here, you know, into New York and New Haven and a few other places, Seattle, San Francisco, Los Angeles, a few in the Midwest, Chicago. You start to see a few sprinkled places get all the way up to green there where the highest incomes are. And then you can do all kinds of interesting things. You can say, you know, let, let's start to examine some of these things. So instead of lat long, let's, uh, let's plot education levels. Uh, somewhere education on this axis, and let's plot uh, income levels on this axis, and they're still color coded. Uh, and the let's see. 
I said education and I wanted unemployment was what I wanted. That's different. So now what you see is, you know, sort of education uh, in the county as in terms of average amount of education versus the unemployment rates. And so you begin to ask interesting questions. So now you can ask questions by just graphically saying, I'm going to put a box around these three because they're sort of outliers in terms of how high the unemployment is and very low. And I can say, well, who are those? And it turns out that those three things are Apache County in Arizona, uh, Apache County in Arizona, different one, and Coca Coconino County in Arizona. So basically three of the Indian reservations in the United States happen to have the lowest average income, I mean education, and the highest average unemployment uh, in the whole country. You know, there, there's uh, uh, other, you can go at the other end of the spectrum and basically pick this one and say, okay, what's that guy? And you'll all be having to know that's Stanford. <laughs> uh, the, and so what's interesting is in Stanford County, uh, they have a lot of education, but uh, their unemployment level is pretty low. But they also don't have a green dot for income. So, yeah. In any case, you know, there's things that you could discover in this data by just crawling around in it and organizing it and sorting it in these ways that, that you might never know. You know, if I, if I went back and looked at, you know, that particular data in the geographic point, you know, sure enough, it shows up over here as Stanford. Now, another thing that we think is happening a lot, and if you were here before we started and watched one of the videos, the, we increasingly think that many of the applications of these devices, whether they're tablets or phones or, uh, or these wall size or conventional computers, is, is no longer going to be sort of consumed one device at a time. Uh, you know, we've already started to ship this technology called smart glass, where your phone or your, or your uh, tablets become sort of an in-your-lap control mechanism for your entertainment experience. So you can play games that way, you can browse the internet on your television, and the keyboard and, and you know, mouse manipulation on your TV screen are just done through the device that's in your hand. But increasingly, we expect that the same thing will be done in, uh, in the business environment. So if you're collaborating with somebody and you're looking at all this data, then it, it turns out that you know, a colleague might be sitting at, you know, having a tablet in their hand in your office, or they could be sitting across the country, and they could be looking at either the same data, or they can be looking at a slightly different one. So you know, for, uh, on this one, let's just say I'm interested in knowing where you know, the sort of the middle income people are uh, that are in median age. And so, you know, I can select that by just in this different graph, which was plotting median age against income, I highlight a part of that. And, you know, on, on my screen in my office, what lights up is the same yellow dots, but in the configuration I'm looking at. And you can say, well, you know, it turns out that the people who make reasonably high incomes and are fairly young, you know, seem to be clustered uh, around the big cities, which, of course, you'd expect. Uh, but your ability to explore in this way and to do it collaboratively in real time is increasingly going to happen more and more. Uh, the, down, the, the video that we showed uh, during the walk-in part, uh, for example, of the, the choir at, at TED, which was part Skype and part in pre you know, physical presence, I think all of these things are just examples that more and more the geographic barriers are just going to disappear. And whether you're physically in the same place or in different places, that the uh, idea of, of real-time collaboration, communication, even entertainment, you know, will increasingly come uh, to be commonplace. I mentioned earlier that, you know, if, if I think of these things as sort of the analytical tools based on visualization and where I'm trying to get the human intellect coupled into the problem as directly as I can, you know, that's one way to do it. But there are a lot of things buried in the data where, in fact, the people don't have an idea. You know, we'd like to have an answer, but we don't really know. And th that's where machine learning uh, really is going to be a powerful tool. And today, a lot of that is based on supervised learning, where it takes, you know, some 
for the high priests to, to manipulate the machine learning capability, but increasingly we're, we're being able to, to, to improve that. And the Holy Grail being a lot of ultimately unsupervised learning, uh, but even along the way, making toolkits that allow people to have this type of high scale machine learning facility applied to these huge data sets, many huge data sets, uh, is getting better and better. So let me show you, um, you know, one other way that we're starting to think about, you know, coupling together this idea of, of searching and learning uh, in order to create other ways to make discoveries and do navigation. So uh, what we have again is an, another uh, prototype. And what this thing is, is, is called DocMap. And if you look at these, you know, topics, you should find all of them familiar to somebody here. What we ingested was, I don't know, some large number of years worth of all the research papers published by the computer science department at Yale. And, uh, and what this system does is it actually reads all the papers and it, uh, it categorizes them. It, it tries to sort of understand them and cluster them uh, around words and based on the size of the words you get some sense of the frequency with which that topic appeared in this whole space. And for any word that's selected, it basically gives you a, a, a list. So think of this as a like a search engine, but this search engine figures out what the interesting words are you want to search on, and then it, it shows you all of the words that are adjacent to those words. So you start to find, you, you discover topical relationships that you, you know, might have never known about. So this, this works, you know, where you can actually uh, uh, scan in and do things, maybe. There it is, it just takes a little time. And, uh, and if, I, if I pick one of these uh, words and, and let's just, well, we picked a couple so I wouldn't have to type too much. So it, I'll, I'll pick vision and put it in and this thing will go grind around and it'll find everything that had vision in it. And, it, and there's a few clusters of them. So here's one around visualization, one around shape, uh, other things and if I basically take these things and and scroll into them you know I I could look up at you know it'll it'll start to add more and more uh, granular detail and you know I can pick any one of these uh, capabilities uh, you know let's just say transformational and it goes out and it finds the papers that were in that cluster and it gives me a, a list of them so you know, here, for example, is, uh, is one fast slant stack, a notion of radon transform for data in a Cartesian grid, which is rapidly computable, algebraically exact, and geometrically faithful and invertible. That's quite a title. Uh, but if I actually touch this, it says, okay, you want me to get you the paper? And I say, yeah, just save it for me. Uh, and it does it. So now I basically discovered a paper that I didn't know existed in a field that I may have an interest in uh, and I'm able to, to, to go get it. Now, as I said, we really expect these devices to come in many different shapes and sizes and flavors and you know, th this one, uh, which was built by the guys who, who do this stuff, uh, is special in that it, it also has things that <laughs> make it change its shape. But what it, what it does is increasingly, you know, you may not buy one that'll actually either stand up or lay down by itself, although you clearly can do that. Uh, I think people will find that they'll replace their whiteboards with these things, and increasingly they'll replace their desk with these things. And what you want is an environment where this whole idea of how you think about, you know, operating wants again to be very natural, that the same things that you already know how to do with your hands and a pen you want them to apply in exactly the same way to the manipulation or review of documents uh, in, in this environment. So, you know, if I take this thing and, and drag it out here from where it was saved, and if I blow it up, sure enough, there's that paper. And, you know, I can read it, 
you know, just flick through it as I was, you know, turn the pages of a book. You know, I could, you know, uh, if I wanted to have a, a different, you know, document, uh, let's just take, take another one and, and pull it out over here. Okay. And uh, I can move this guy around, put him up there, make it bigger. Active vision system for a social robot. You know, if I, uh, let's just say I'll, I'll pick uh, yellow to highlight this. Now I, I've got my pen. And of course, if you think about how you would normally work, what people don't really realize unless you study it is if I give you a piece of paper and I ask you to write something, the first thing, let's say you're right handed, the first thing you do is you put your left hand down on the paper and then you think you start to write. Someday go try to write without using your left hand. All right, you'll find it incredibly difficult that people, when they write, are almost continuously changing the relationship of the paper to themselves and to the thing that they're writing in, in order to facilitate it. So writing is really a two-hand thing for most people, not a one-hand thing. But of course, computers in the past haven't really facilitated that because if you had a touch interface, it got confused. All right, well, was he touching or writing? So in this system, it actually can distinguish completely separately the touch of your hand from the touch of the pen. And in addition, it's not just one touch, it's arbitrary touch. And so it turns out now the process of, if I want to review this, this, uh, this document, uh, the, my, you know, I can turn the pages and I say, well, it's really kind of hard to annotate it that way, but if I actually just put my hand down, this paper works just like real paper. So I can write with two hands, I could annotate this, you know, I could, I could flip it up, I can go to the next page, uh, you know, I can make the whole thing bigger, I can make the whole thing smaller. And all of the things that you would naturally do by just, you know, the movement of your, your, your left hand to control the, ratio, the relationship of the paper to your pen and to your eye, all that happens completely naturally. So much like the fresh paint was an attempt to simulate the physics of painting, more and more, we're trying to, you know, emulate the physics of dealing with pen and paper. You know, it's been around a while, you know, for a good reason. And the question is, just because you can say everything should be on a screen doesn't mean you should give up, you know, the long-developed uh, uh, capabilities and benefits that people have from operating uh, in this environment. You know, you can do other interesting things. You know, here I can pull in a map. Uh, you know, I can basically make the map big, you know, with one hand I can, you know, twist it around like I would if I was, let's say I'm looking here for New Haven. So I just kind of zoom in, okay, here comes New Haven. Uh, and I can just keep moving it around with one hand till I find it and say, okay, here we are, you know, Yale University. And so, I mean, you know, the ability to take this map in real time over the internet suck it up, manipulate it, twist it around, annotate on it, clip parts out of it, send it to other people. It's basically better than, better than paper uh, because I haven't given up almost anything uh, that was a problem in the ability to manipulate the thing, but I've gained the ability to pan and zoom, to rotate it, you know, to clip things out of it and, and uh, do things that are just impossible with paper. So I think that, you know, more and more, these are examples of what we call natural user interfaces. It's not simply the idea, can we emulate speech and vision and, and you know, haptic kind of things. It's can you then use those to build new models of interaction for applications that make it just completely natural for people to use these computer systems. So we're very excited about that, and while the classical graphical interface isn't going to disappear, I think it's, we're kind of in a stage now which has, you know, I'll say frequently occurred when technology shifts happen. Uh, you know, people remind me, I'm old but I'm not quite this old, uh, that when the mo motion picture camera was invented, the first thing they did with it was they filmed plays. And it was actually only years later that they realized that, you know, that they didn't have to film the whole play at once. They could actually film chunks of it and then splice the films together. 
And so what we know today is the major motion picture wasn't at all what anybody had in mind when they created the movie camera. And, and I think we're kind of in that stage now in this transition between graphical interfaces you know, and the movement to natural interaction. That when you get to this point, you really want to stand back and ask yourself the question, you know, how do I just get the computer to help me more? And I always tell people, like, one of my goals for the work at Microsoft is, I say, okay, how, how should a farmer in rural India, you know, be able to use this machine learning, you know, capability? You know, he should be able to pick up his phone and, and say, what day should I fertilize? And the thing comes back and says, Thursday, <laughs> all right? And so, I mean, in essence, he asked a question that is exactly what he would have asked to a human colleague that he, who knew the context, was an expert in the domain, you know, and knew everything about, you know, what the guy was already doing. And that's the power of this big data machine learning combination, is it allows us to essentially continually learn about context. You know, for those of you that have people that work with you, whether they're assistants, you know, personal assistants, people who work in your lab with you, <clears throat> you realize those people get more valuable to you the longer you work with them, <laughs> for the most part. Uh, and, and the reason is they have context. And right now, your computers, by and large, are not getting more valuable the longer you work with them because it isn't essentially uh, aggregating the context that it has. But with computers so intimately involved in, you know, our work, our play, you know, uh, you know uh, shopping, virtually everything that we do, uh, the amount of context that the system is capable of, of inhaling and, and managing is really stunning. That brings with it a whole set of new challenges, both on the policy uh, and regulatory front, as well as the technology front, for example, in, in the privacy space. Uh, when Rick and I worked on the health IT report, it actually, one part was the invention of the mechanism that would solve the problem of combining it, the data. And the happy thing was that it also turned out to be a mechanism that gave you a, a way to have the technology manage the usage-based access to the data, hence an attempt to solve the privacy problem. And I think, you know, this is one of the great challenges for the computer science and computer business community these days is to try to figure out how do you design these systems such that the value of the big data isn't forced to be lost simply because people are paranoid about certain bad things could happen. Many more good things can happen. We just have to be sure that we can reel in the bad ones ex post facto. And I think it's completely clear that we have the technical means to do that. It's just that people haven't been uh, sort of forced or, or, uh, or made incentivized to go build those things yet, but I think that'll come. So let me move on, you know, beyond this type of, I'll say, analytics and discovery where the human is driving, a little bit more to the kind of things that we're doing where the machine is driving uh, the discovery process. And, uh, you know, if you look at this slide, it's just six examples I selected where Microsoft inside the company for as long as I know, as far back as at least eight years, I can, I can remember, uh, has been using machine learning in order to build sort of surprising capabilities into products. Uh, speech recognition, uh, it, you know, in phones and other devices uh, for quite a long time. Uh, true skill, many people in the room probably have at some point played an Xbox game. And if you play multi-party versions, particularly over the network, and you go to the game lobby, you know, to, dis to find somebody to play with, it turns out one of the challenges we discovered very early on is when you have so many people, if you use just random assignment of players, you get a very unappetizing experience for both, for all the people. Because the odds that you have people that are, you know, reasonably well matched is not that high. Uh, because, you know, the, the quality of, of your gameplay can vary in so many dimensions that there's no simple metric you know, that says, hey, you know, is this guy a good match for that guy? And so we started to use machine learning to, to figure out out of this huge, uh, 
you know, multidimensional space, which things produced satisfying competition. You know, otherwise it's sort of like putting a pro against an amateur. The amateur says, well, why do I even try? And the pro says, why am I wasting my time playing this idiot? And, you know, and you don't want that. So you really want all these competitions to be pretty much even up, and that, that system does that. The whole search and ad business is all built on machine learning, you know, knowing what ad to deliver, when to deliver it, how to, how to scan the web, what to, you know, keep and what not to keep, uh, it, you know, is a machine learning problem. Uh, one of the things that we actually just shipped that's been a dream for many of us for a long time is the intelligent inbox. Uh, in Office 365, we've just started to turn on this capability. <clears throat> it observes how you handle all your mail, you know, for several thousand pieces of mail. And, and based on what it learns, it begins to automatically uh, manage your inbox for you. It, it clusters things together, it moves things that it thinks you would assume are higher priority up. Uh, and it even gets to the point where it can start to make recommended dis disposition of those documents. Like, it'll, you know, you sit down and the thing sees you and says, oh, okay, you know, I, I looked at your mail and all these I think you're going to delete. Should I? <laughs> all right. And you just say yes and they all go away. And uh, in these it says, you know, these I know you're going to respond to uh, and I, I've drafted some, you know, basic responses for you. Uh, you want to send them. And so more and more, you know, the computer just starts to say it, it, when it can pattern match and say I, I know that this person is important and this one less, you know, it starts to help you figure that out. The whole concept of gesture recognition in Connect was all based on machine learning. And uh, in Bing Maps, traffic prediction. You know, if you go and ask for a route, it says, do you want to know that, you know, now what the traffic is? Telling people, here's the route only based on the traffic that we currently have is not all that interesting. Uh, what's a lot more interesting is to predict you know, over the time it takes them to drive the route, what will the traffic be at those points? So by basically taking on all the historical factors and all the exogenous things like weather and ball games and, and everything else, and then monitoring accident reports, the thing can actually figure out a forecast of, you know, what, what congestion will be like at every point in the route before you drive it, and then it'll adjust the route dynamically. One of the great things that's been uh, holy grail for us at Microsoft and many people in the, in the computer science and research community for years has been the quest to do real-time speech-to-speech uh, translation. And uh, at Microsoft, one of the ways that, that we try to aggregate our research results uh, into solving larger scale sort of composite real-world problems is to, is to give ourselves these kind of objectives. And so, about two years ago, Rick Rashid, who's shown uh, in, the, in the next slide, I, I think it comes up, is, uh, he's the guy who founded and, and actually runs Microsoft Research day by day. He said, hey, you know, uh, by the end of 2012, I want to go to China, give a speech, and, and I want to be able to speak in my normal voice in English, uh, and I, I want the loudspeaker system to, you know, to project Chinese in essentially real time in my own voice. <laughs> and uh, so we actually did that. Uh, we think that's sort of a real milestone achievement in the field. And it, it was all based on some real breakthroughs in the last few years in what's called deep neural networks and the use of these very high scale machines and very large data sets uh, to be able to train machines uh, to be able to do this. So I'm going to show you a one minute clip that was from that speech in China last fall. Uh, but you get an idea. What, what you'll see happening, and I'll explain it now so you can watch it, is he talks, it translates his speech uh, into English text. It converts the English text to Chinese text. It does a, a text-to-speech synthesis in Chinese, all right, and then it plays that through a vocoder model that we developed from his voice. So it's actually his vocal track that, so just like Fresh Paint was a simulation of painting, this is a simulation of his, the physics of his vocal track, you know, and we use that so that the things, it's a language he doesn't speak, but it's his voice 
in another language. So we'll play that for one minute. I'm speaking in English, and hopefully you'll hear me speak in Chinese in my own voice. Again, the results are not perfect. There are, in fact, quite a few errors. There's much work to be done in this area. But this technology is very promising. And we hope in a few years that we'll be able to break down the language barriers between people. So what do you think? So you know, this turns out to be, again, important. If you go back to the, the walk-in video of the TED choir, you know, there it was music and you didn't have a language problem. Uh, and you had people from all over the world who could, who could collaborate with each other. But by and large, language is a problem and will obviously remain so for a long period of time. If you want to have a sort of global communication and collaboration, particularly in real time. And so the idea that, uh, and I'm gonna ask, ask Ethan to come up and, and we'll kind of move into this next demo a little bit. Um, to think about what it's like whether you're sitting at a desk like this where he is or I am, and th there's just a, a tablet sitting here running Skype. Uh, it's on a desk that looks like it has a desk lamp. These are very special desk lamps in that they, are both, they both project and see at the same time. They don't just light. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll show you just a second. And, but if you think about it, you know, when I sit down here today, you know, Ethan and I both speak English. And, you know, I could ask him for some help or he could ask me for some help. But again, we wanted the thing to be very natural. So this is a research thing called the LumaShare. And what it does is it, it basically brings the idea of, you know, natural drawing, reading, writing, examination of objects uh, at, at a distance, you know, to a, an environment where people don't have to know anything to be able to do that. So you're looking at essentially what I'm seeing. So he's writing in real time with a regular pen. It shows up on paper on his side, and it shows up projected on my side. And, and so, you know, we both appear to see exactly the same thing. I'll, uh, you know, I'll just use green and I'll circle this, and, you know, in real time, he would see that on the other side. <laughs> the, we can give this to, to children that literally aged three years old, and they sit down and they use it immediately. And, the idea that the, that the person they're collaborating with is somewhere else, they see them on the screen, they draw, it works, you know, like what's the problem? And, uh, and, but you know, you can take things and say, hey, you know, how about helping with my, my math? You know, so, you know, he can take a, uh, you know, his, his triangle and he can draw something there. You know, he can put another line there. And I say, look, all right, well, you know, I, could, I can finish this drawing and, you know, I could be getting some help, you know. Uh, you could think of doing this, you know, Rick and I talk a lot about MOOCs, you know, and what's their impact on education at every level and around the world. But, you know, if you have this as a vehicle where you're taking online courses and you've got social interaction and you can do this kind of, you know, help, help me figure this out. You know, I can say, hey, this looks like it's 90 degrees. You know, this one, uh, who knows, you know, I don't, I don't know what this, this thing is, but he could measure it for me. He says, oh, 39 degrees. So I can say, all right, well, well, what do you think this one is? And he can explain to me that, you know, they have to add up to 180 and it all works. And, and so there's a lot of interesting stuff. Now these discussions, these interactions are all being recorded in the cloud. So to some extent, <laughs> yeah, close enough. The, 
But, you know, now if I take this paper and throw it away, you know, you can see I only had half of the conversation and he had half of the conversation. Uh, and what we really want to do is be able to each ultimately walk away thinking we had the whole conversation. So we'll do like one more that shows how this might work. So we, because we're more and more focused on machine vision, another big use of machine learning, you know, here's a set of objects. And as the, as the system begins to, to uh, recognize these objects, you can do more interesting things. So here, you know, uh, what this is, it's a, a gadgeteer board. It's just, it's, it's a thing where people who want to prototype small electronic uh, gadgets, they buy these things. And so Ethan, you know, may have said to me, hey, look, I've got this thing. I have no idea really how to hook it up. And I say, yeah, well, I've played with this, and I can tell you that, you know, these, these five things here are all where you plug in the USB connectors. And, you know, this set of things down here is where you plug in the LEDs. And, you know, this little button right here is the reset button. And you can say, okay, thanks, that's really useful. Yeah, but he says, now I've got to go away and use it. So if I walk away and crumple this thing up, uh, and he walks away, you know, the next time he comes and sits down at a system, the thing basically can look at the physical object, you know, hopefully will recognize that it's seen it before, and basically brings back, you know, the annotations. And it'll register them no matter where he puts it and, you know, how he moves it around. And so basically it is as if he had the whole conversation, even though part of it was virtual and part of it was physical. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks. And uh, so... So this is one of the really popular things. It turns out you can take this lamp and turn it up and shine it on the wall. Same thing works, okay? So, you know, whether you want to do whiteboards or desktops, uh, you know, we think that ultimately <laughs> the cost of this shouldn't be substantially more than the cost of a desk lamp. Uh, and because, you know, if you look at how small we can make cameras and, you know, how cheap LED lighting is and, uh, you know, these little projectors are, uh, that's all we assemble this out of, and then a bunch of clever software algorithms and interfacing technology. Because it turns out, you know, what you have to do is interleave the frames. So you, one frame you project, and then you blank, and then you look, all right? And by interleaving these things at a high rate, it appears that you're doing both at the same time, uh, even though it's in a high ambient light kind of environment. So, you know, this is, uh, this is the way that we're making computers, you know, more like us. <laughs> Uh, and with it, I think, you know, we're, we're making these things much more powerful, much more available uh, to people, and, and I think easier to use and get real benefit from. So let me just close by showing you uh, just a short video that it just came from uh, every year Microsoft Research holds a thing we call TechFest, and it's sort of our internal market for ideas that we generate in research, because th there's about, you know, I'll say nominally 1,000 people in the core research group and about 35 or 40,000 people in the engineering groups that make, make products. And, you know, the real question is always, <clears throat> when you do basic science, how do you get it tech transferred, uh, you know, in an, in an efficient way? And it's a challenge. Even in one company, you know, it's a challenge. And uh, so we created TechFest a few years ago, which is like a, a trade fair that we put, and all the people from our labs in the 10 places around the world come and we set this big thing up for three days, and they come and they go, and they just walk around and see all these things. So some of the, a lot of the talk that I gave you today were things I selected. Now, it turns out each year, we down-select to about 200 of the best things that come out of research. And what I showed you today was about four or five. And so I'm just going to show you a video that's just like a, you know, eye candy that, that just, you know, you know, flashes by, and you'll see the, the incredible range of things that is ongoing. And, you know, I offer that to you to help you understand, you know, so many people, I think, get jaded. They say, oh, computers, I understand it all. How's it going to change? You know, I mean, we've seen everything. And, you know, our view is you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the rate at which this stuff is changing is, is very high, and, you know, the, the amount of, of benefit that society will get from it is, is amazing. So uh, let's close with the last video.
And this is the one I showed you here. Just another dozen or two of the things that are going on. Uh, it, it's an uh, incredible uh, privilege to be able to be affiliated with this group and this company. Uh, and, you know, I hope we, you get a little appreciation for the range of things that we do. So, uh, before we go into the Q&A session, and because I know some people can't stay for the whole time, we're going to give away the door prizes. Uh, and so if you get your little tickets out, um, I'm going to pull out these things and this is Erica. She, she is the person you want to see to claim your gift. Uh, so the first two gifts are uh, new handy dandy Windows Phone 8. There'll be two of them. Uh, so the first one is, and I'll just say the last three digits, ends in 315. 315. You have to be present to win. <laughs> huh? no, no 315? Okay. One down. Pick another one. 763. Okay, seven, all right. So see this lady afterward, the phone. All right, second phone, 825. Okay, there's the second phone, all right. Okay, we're going up, we're going up scale here now. Now we're giving away three Xbox with connects. Uh, <laughs> okay, 191. 191, there it is, over here. All right. Next one, 764. Okay, back in the corner there. And the third Xbox, 925. Oh, oh, close. No cigar. 925, right back. Oh, back there. Okay, that's great. Okay, and the last are three Surface RTs. Okay, so 153, 153. Okay, there's one, oh, that, that's a lucky row over there. <laughs> I'll have to sort these better. 749. <laughs> I think there's something going on here. <laughs> Three in a row over there. Okay, 907. Okay, back over there. Is that, that's two? Oh, that's all three of them? Okay, great. All right, enjoy them. Okay, so if you have to leave or you're welcome to go, don't go bad. And if you want to stay, we'll do Q&A for another uh, 20 minutes or so. Huh? Rick says I should tell you that it's Pepe's Pizza that's uh, being served at the end, so I guess that's significant. Yeah, okay. Okay, so there's two microphones in the aisles up here, and if you want to have a question, line up there, and we'll pipeline between the two of them. So, 
I think this lady wants to be first. <laughs> so let's go ahead and start. Okay, hi, thank you so much for the presentation and thank you for the demos. I really appreciate the demos. Um, I actually have a question about the uh, very first demo you showed us. I was wondering, um, in addition to the physics engine for rendering the graphics for a painting, um, are you going to, um, uh, have you thought about uh, incorporating haptic feedback into the stylus or the pens or the paintbrushes so that when the painter paints on the surface, they'll have some sort of haptic feedback on, uh, on the pen, so like when they can feel uh, friction or viscous drag or even the bumps on the surface? Yeah, yeah I, I don't really know myself whether the team has actively contemplated that or not. Of course, we have a huge amount of experience on the gaming side mm -hmm. with haptic feedback. So I, I think, you know, technologically it's possible. It's hard to, I think, not distort the, you know, the feel. I mean, we have a bunch of things in research where I've actually used them, not with the fresh paint application, where, you know, we're providing haptic feedback, like where you can take a stylus or something and move it, you know, or you can, like, you, you push it and see a virtual object and hit it, you, you know, you mm -hmm. feel that you run into it. But to do it, you know, you, you got a pantograph type of mechanism, you know, with actuators that are, you know, there to create that kind of three-dimensional force. And it's, it's hard for this kind of freehand thing to, to keep yourself attached and I think not disturb that relationship. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure somebody will come up with some clever way, you know, to, to figure that out. Okay, great, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you so much for coming here. Love the presentation. Thanks. So, my name is Ayush, and I'm a CS major here. And I see a bunch of other CS people here, too. And what I really want to know is, how do you get a job at Microsoft Research? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, by and large, the, the research people primarily, I, I would say to the, you know, 90 odd percent level, you know, we only hire people who, who have PhDs in the fields of interest, primarily computer science, but, but it's, it's quite broad now. We're, we're, we've actually built a group doing economics. Uh, you know, we have a group that is uh, focused a lot in uh, social, uh, you know, behavioral science and that kind of thing. And, but, you know, Send, send your resume to those guys. Uh, I mean, the, it, I mean, I'll tell you, it is selective, and a lot of people who end up there at one point or another have have passed through Microsoft Research either as an intern, a postdoc, you know, or or some other uh, capacity, you know, in in their on their way to to ultimately getting in there. Um, you know, we don't grow the thing very quickly, and, and we have very low turnover. So, you know, it's, there's some opportunity every year, but it's not a huge number. Today, we have about 900 PhDs uh, doing the basic science. Thank you. Um, when I saw the uh, demos of some of your products, I couldn't help but notice that uh, even the high performance data visualization ones were being run out of a web browser. I was wondering uh, what sort of framework you were using to do that. To be honest, I don't know what they, probably did. I mean, look, most of the stuff we're doing now, I mean, as you were talking about earlier today, you know, we do st stuff with Silverlight. There's a huge effort on HTML5-based, uh, you know, capabilities. And I, I don't know what, you know, the research guys used for these particular demos. I, I've just never tried to go look at it. Thank you. Hi. So. Now that computers are being integrated into our lives in a greater and greater level to basically ever aspects of our lives, I was wondering what level of computer science education should be given as either a core component of, of a college education or even lower level than college education? Well, one, I think it should start a lot earlier than college. Uh, I actually was talking at dinner last night to, to Rick's wife, Jane, and uh, we actually were having this conversation because I was basically saying that, you know, my view was that, that this, idea, this idea of what we call computational thinking is, it's not computer science, it's not programming, but it's basically understanding, you know, how you think about problem solving using computational methods. It's something that uh, a woman at Microsoft Research now named Jeanette Wing has been advocating, particularly when she was at the National Science Foundation. And I do think that from an early age, we need to start to basically get people, 
exposed, at least in the abstract, to computational thinking. And, and if you understand that, then it's easier to, to sort of branch out based on how aggressive you want to be in terms of either understanding implementation, learning programming. But more and more, the, um, the number of things you can do without writing a line of code is unbelievable. Uh, one thing, maybe some of you have already seen it, it's, it's in the current shipping version of Excel. <clears throat> you know, the spreadsheets were fantastic, you know, because they gave people who didn't have to write a line of code a direct ability to, to translate what they wanted to do in that sort of spreadsheet computational model, you know, and using only things they understood, like writing math formulas, you know, the ability to make very powerful analyses. But there are a lot of things that we do, particularly in this big data world, where you can't express those things in any check the box, you know, script or, or, or menu like thing. So what we just shipped in, in, uh, in the new version of Excel is a, a feature called Flash Fill. And what Flash Fill does is it actually does real time program synthesis. So you teach it what you want it to do to data by showing a few examples of the transformations. And each time you give it an example, it resynthesizes a program that will do that to all your data. And, 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 and it runs it in real time. And then you look at it, and if there's something wrong, you take the one that wasn't right, you change that example, resynthesize it again. And, and in, in most cases, you can write a program without knowing you're writing a program by just showing it, teaching it what you wanted it to do to the data. And I think that more and more, for the ma vast majority of people, they won't, they will get very satisfying results from their computer without ever having the idea that they had to write a program. And I think that that's why I, I think in terms of this basic education, it's going to be more important to teach people computational thinking than it is any particular computational method uh, that we use today. Well, just a very quick statement. I I think those of us in computer science hope that what we're teaching is the computational thinking and the programming language is just an added bonus. Doesn't seem to be true, <laughs> <laughs> to be completely candid. Uh, just, it, you know, from, at least from my vantage point and Jeanette, you know, who spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff, you know, I don't, I don't think we're getting there even in the computer science departments. And we're certainly not doing it for young kids. And, you know, I think that we have to think that reading, writing, and arithmetic, you know, you need to have the, the fourth one, you know, which is sort of computational thinking has to be in there somehow uh, uh, for people to be able to be functional in this world of the future. Thank you. Hi. So um, thank you very much for the talk again. My question was uh, regarding synchronization and identity uh, management. So in the future, I see power users maybe having a Microsoft Surface tablet, wearing Google glasses, and listening to music on their iPhones at the same time. So how does Microsoft have any plans to work towards sort of synchronizing all of these technologies and allowing people to maintain one identity? Uh, <clears throat> well, I mean, you know, we. We produce these identity systems, and we let all the third-party application people use them. So in a sense, we're not stopping Google or anybody else from deciding to allow that identity to be used or federated with their own identity. Uh, right now, I think that each of these companies tends to think, hey, you know, I've got my community, and if I can keep them corralled under this identity, uh, then, you know, they like that better. And, you know, Microsoft comes, you could say, more from a platform orientation historically, where we kind of give people these tools and let them write. You know, anybody could write any app for Windows. You know, anybody can, can do, write any, you know, macro for Excel or macro for Office. And so I think in, these, in the case of identity, we are already very active in this idea of having to federate identity, because we know that people can't just have one. So for example, we know everybody has got to have at least you know, I'll call it a personal identity, a government-issued identity, a uh, probably an, a, an institutional identity. You know, and so just let's just let's just say, even if they're willing to accept Microsoft account as a personal identity, if they go to work, they probably get a work identity, and 
when they were born, the government gave them an identity. <laughs> and, you know, somehow they're all going to have to get federated. So we're focused a lot more on pr producing the mechanism for federation, and then it'll be up to the market to decide or demand, you know, when these things app by app essentially get federated. Okay, thank you. Hi, Rick. It was a very impressive talk. I was really enjoyed it. My, my question was about the competition between Microsoft and Apple. So I think re I remember when I was in high school, I think it was way before iPhone, that I saw this fantastic video that asked the video show me, showed us today about, you know, I think the video was about Surface Computing. I don't know whether you, uh, you probably know that project. And then, you know, and then after that, you know, 2007, Steve Jobs launched iPhone and then, you know, iPad. And so what happened, what slowed Microsoft down, you know, in the competition between, you know, Apple? And uh, I think the second part of the question is, you show us the, this marvelous app, you know, when you can, you know, use oil painting or something. But there's already this app. There are actually a bunch of apps that are fascinating that digital illustrators are using in App Store, like, you know, Procreate or the, the app called Paper that I use every day in, in an App Store that does fantastic job about, you know, watercoloring. And actually they, they have, you know, stylus with, you know, whatever Bluetooth and can have, you know, pawn rejection. So you actually can tell whether you are touching the paper or you actually are writing. So, you know, all these things that you said today was very impressive, but I think, you know, there's something that you know, I was thinking, yeah, Microsoft is doing great, but, you know, how are they going to compete with Apple since they're sort of, you know, half a step ahead? So that's my question. Yeah, I mean, the, my view of this is that it's frustrating for me, but, you know, Microsoft shipped music players before the iPod, touch, you know, devices before the touch, uh, had a 30 share in smartphones before there was an iPhone, and have shipped, t you know, tablet computers for 13 years. I'd say our problem wasn't technology. Our problem was marketing. You know, we basically, as a company, made a set of choices during that period of time for a variety of reasons that ended up with us not making the kind of investment that was necessary to sustain those leadership positions or to capitalize on them. And once you seed them, you know, then recovering them is, is more difficult. And, you know, you could say there's good news and bad news. At least Microsoft has the technological capacity and financial capacity, you know, to take these things that you know, maybe are strategic and that we didn't follow through on and work to recover our positions. The, the thing I'll point out, I mean, if I go back five or six years and I give you this, I'll give you this quiz, okay, six years ago, who were going to be the kings of smartphones? I would probably answer Nokia or... Nokia, Motorola, Motorola. and RIM, yeah. maybe. Okay, so they all basically are, you know, dead or dying, <laughs> all right? And the reason is they weren't software companies, all right? And their ability to basically keep in a leadership position when the thing was no longer about making phone calls, but where phone calls are just an app on a computer that's in your hand, was an inversion of their skill set. We at least, you know, don't have, that problem. Microsoft, you know, I think has a demonstrated capability to do either the hardware if we have to or the software. And, and we've, you know, learned some of our lessons, you know, for our failures. We paid a big price for some of that, that problem. And so I, I think that, you know, we probably hopefully won't make the same set of mistakes twice at this juncture. And I'll also point out that if I just went back, I'll say two or so years ago, and said, you know, well, do you guys think Apple is unstoppable in phones? Are they just going to, you know, rule the planet on phones? Most people would say, oh, I guess so. And right now, their share is only 67% or 65% of Samsung's share. And so it turns out all of the consumers are incredibly fickle, all right? <laughs> And as a result, you know, all they care about, particularly groups like this one, is, you know, the cool factor. Yeah. And, and they can afford it. And so, you know, 
I don't think <laughs> Apple has any lock on this stuff at all. And, you know, they've done a great job doing what they did. We let them do it, all right? And, you know, my view is had we been on top of our game on the sort of marketing side at the time where we had put these things out, you know, you'd be sitting around asking, you know, can anybody stop Microsoft in this category? So, you know, it just shows that, you know, in business, all the elements of execution are important. And, you know, we can have the big research group, we can have all the products, we can even ship them earlier than other people. But if you don't basically get the weight of the company behind it when you're in these new categories, it doesn't guarantee you any sustained success. And, frankly, even having some sustained success doesn't guarantee it, you know, if somebody comes along with the next cool thing. So, you know, the, you know, I guess, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens. Uh, you know, it was kind of, um, it's kind of funny. I mean, when we shipped the Surface, you know, Apple kept saying, you know, in a, in a joking way, you know, why would anybody want one of these things, you know, that, it, that seems to be this, this hybrid, you know, and we said, well, why would anybody think they had to carry two devices, you know. So the marketplace will ultimately tell us, you know, who was right and who was wrong. But I can tell you that I go to a lot of places today where people have, are walking around with iPads and Macs and saying, you know, why can't, like Rick was asking, he says, well, you know, I really want Office on the iPad, but I have to carry my Mac, okay? And, you know, I just think that, that, that people ultimately resonate with the stuff that helps them get their jobs done. And when you have breakthroughs in some of these areas, the momentum shift is very, very quickly. You know, and I think, you know, people, you even see that reflect a little bit in how the market values Apple, you know, down from 700 to 400 and change. You know, that's a reflection of something. I mean, we have the same problem. For 10 years, we've been flat because people keep wanting to declare that we're going to die. Okay. We're the third most valuable company in the country. All right. <laughs> you know, we make more money than, than these other guys do in profit and so you know the, the the market is a weird weird animal but uh, you know i think we're doing some interesting stuff and we'll see how the market reacts thank you so much and good luck with the next founder thank you um hi so firstly i also just wanted to say thank you and i was really impressed with especially the visualization demos um i have like three questions Should try them one at a time okay <laughs> Um, so the first was related to what the previous guy just asked. Um, while you were demonstrating the painting app, like the first thing that popped into my mind was I've seen this before, like seven years ago, because um, I do like digital art, <coughs> so I've seen a lot of this. So um, I guess my question for that is, um, there's definitely going to be a lot of. You, you've actually seen something seven years ago that actually did the physics simulation yeah. of the oil paint. Yeah. Um, Where was that? Coral. That didn't do that. <laughs> they, maybe not seven, but like several years ago. Okay. Um, so there's definitely going to be a lot of like duplicates and people researching the same things. So um, always is true. Microsoft's interest in like acquiring them and working with them, or like competing and seeing who can do, who can reach the goal first. Uh, you know, those are all just pragmatic business decisions that get made by the people who run those groups in the company. And, you know, Microsoft collaborates with, you know, thousands of companies. We buy companies big and small when it seems like, you know, an appropriate and mutually interesting thing to do. Uh, and, you know, some people think they just would rather compete or we might decide we could do better alone and we'll do it. So there's no fixed answer to that question. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's all largely driven by economic analysis at the end of, you know, how do you think you, you win? Okay. Um, and the second one is, uh, you were talking a lot about, um, like, basically computers everywhere. And in the videos playing at the beginning, um, there was stuff like that as well. So I guess my question is, um, where is, like, how are we going to power all these devices? And um, are you thinking of providing technology, like 
of the future to situations where there's a lack of power or connectivity? Because you were talking about like an internet of devices and that kind of thing. Well, by, if you mean power, you're talking about the electrical yeah. <laughs> source. I mean, I don't think that that's going to be the, the big question. I mean, you know, any one of these computers consumes a lot less energy than one light bulb. So, you know, when people run around and say, hey, I'm worried about all these computers, the first thing they should ask themselves is, well, why aren't you worried about all those light bulbs? All right, you know, turn off a light bulb, you know, or put an LED thing in there, you can buy another computer. So, uh, personally, I, and the reason I say that is we, keep, we continue to drive the energy consumption of computers lower and lower and lower and lower. And so, uh, I just think that trend will continue at both the data center scale as well as the individual device scale. Batteries, uh, you know, are a chemistry problem. You know, they're not going to get better radically anytime soon. So, the, the, the quest for mobility, you know, really forces you to drive the cost, I mean, the, the, the power consumption down. On the connectivity side, that is a, a personal interest I've had for 12 or 13 years. And in fact, I took the initiative personally and with the company to advocate for regulatory changes globally in how spectrum is allocated in order to be able to uh, provide long haul Wi-Fi is a simple way to think about it. And a lot of that was in fact anticipating the need to provide connectivity in, in environments where uh, there just you know, isn't any or isn't any adequate or where the economics of delivering it under conventional terms like cellular systems is just not going to be feasible. And so, you know, it is an area that I've invested a lot of time in and we're having some success. Yes, sir. Um, I'm curious, you know, obviously these things that you showed us today are so great and there's so many positives to it. Um, but I think a lot of people would argue that there also are a lot of downsides, you know, this being connected all the time and having your phone constantly and your, you know, your tablet. And um, so I guess I'm curious how both personally and, you know, as a representative of it's Microsoft. It's only a problem for people with no willpower. Right. I, so I guess, I'm, you know, I'm curious how you see the potential downsides of increasing technology the way we are and, you know, whether y you see you having a role or a responsibility to sort of mitigate some of these, you know, fears that people might have? Well, I don't know whether I have a responsibility to mitigate their fears. I think right. I have a responsibility <laughs> to, to reflect in the products the needs of the population. So uh, if, if you're right and people really decide, wow, this is really bad, you know, we, you know, we're too distracted while we're driving or whatever it is. My view is, hey, we're just engineers, give us the problem, we'll come up with a fix. All right, so you know, if a, a huge amount of what we're doing now is to make the management of the computer's interaction with you a lot more manageable. I mean, part of the problem you've got right now with all these devices in your life is in fact they don't know about each other. All right, and so you have the job of essentially coordinating their action. You have the job of synchronizing their, their data sets or whatever is important to you. And you can't sort of ask them in some, you know, general way to, like, to change their behavior or to modulate their behavior based on what you're actually doing. And so those are things that we are all working on doing. And, you know, my view is we'll continue to make that just naturally better. It won't go crazy and out of control. And to the extent that, that any of that gets out of hand, the marketplace will then favor the products that provide the integral facilities to do that management. And, uh, and, and so it turns out that's, that's, that particular one is not one that I you know, think will be any kind of persistent problem. So you're not worried at all about, you know, when people say that people don't interact as much face to face or that sort of stuff, you're not, you don't think, you think people will want what they want and then once they realize it's out of hand or if it yeah, ever gets out of hand. Look, I mean, whether people interact face to face, y you can talk about sociological right. problems, but you know, you know, I would tell you that the isolation created by people staring at televisions was a much bigger problem than, quote, the isolation, it isn't really isolation at all, that, that people are now spending too much time interacting with other people, they're just doing it in a computer mediated way, which was worse. You know, my view is, hey, you're a lot better off, you're at least communicating with another human, you know, it may be in some new way, but you're not like, you know, a couch potato sitting there watching your TV screen. So I, I personally tend to think that, that these things are actually trending in a positive direction 
And, and yes, we're going to get different sociological behaviors as, as we adjust to that, but you know, I think it's completely natural, and, and I have a lot of confidence in the human species it's, and its ability to adjust to these things. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, I had kind of a general question, uh, kind of about the open source and freeware technology that's kind of out there right now. Um, so in the past, obviously, all this stuff was really accessible only by a very small segment of like a rar rarefied set of very complex, you know, advanced users. But kind of the, the bar to use some of these freeware technologies has, has gone down a lot in recent years to the point where, you know, now Linux distributions are pretty available uh, and some people are using those instead of Windows. We have um, a lot of people prefer R or Python programming languages to like MATLAB or Stata and people are using like open office instead of office. So it seems like to me at least that there's kind of becoming a split between uh, the ad advanced community which is using a lot of this sort of uh, open source freeware and kind of the basic community. So I kind of two quick questions on that. One was do you feel like that is sort of uh, putting a pressure on Microsoft to be designing more towards like sort of the more common users rather than uh, the advanced power users and also in general what your thoughts are on the open source movement and uh, sort of the, the power of the global developer base to create compelling technologies for free? Well, I, one initial reaction I have is I can probably introduce you a lot of people who don't, who, who use proprietary products who would not choose to refer to themselves as basic. So, I mean, you know, you got, the, you have this sort of elitist characterization of, oh, there's us guys who can use that stuff and everybody else is lesser people. I think that's a bad characterization for starters. Uh, that said, I mean, you know, the idea that there's free software is not new. I mean, you know, it's, it goes, I mean, when I started my company in 1983, we built an operating system on the Berkeley distribution of Unix at the time. And, and so there's really nothing new. It's happening at a larger scale, and you could say it's accelerated simply because of the degree of connectivity that the world, you know, has available to it now. And with that, you, you know, you can get these collaborative efforts that can take on some fairly significant problems and make them available. And, you know, I think th that, that's all good. I view the whole thing as, as sort of symbiotic. Um, it turned out, if a company like Microsoft tilted what it did uh, to say, you know, we're, we're just going to build products that would be better for that elite group of users than whatever they can get out of the open source community at any given minute in time, we go broke because there aren't really enough of them. You know, in a world where we have to serve, you know, a billion or two people a year to put, you know, food on the table, uh, you know, there just aren't enough people, you know, if you're selling only that class of products to, to an elite audience. So we like to believe that, if, you know, that, that we can provide technology for people who are elite users and who choose to operate in the framework that we provide. But, you know, we're very realistic a about that. You know, the new Azure cloud facility at Microsoft, one of the things that we put up on top of that is Hadoop. You know, so we did the work to host it in that environment so that people who wanted to be able to rent that capability in the context where it worked with other Microsoft-related products, which you couldn't get if you ran it yourself or put it in Amazon, AWS, you know, made it a lot easier. So, you know, there are many reasons that people may choose to do that and many practical reasons where Microsoft may take things that that community wants and, and sort of host it in our own environment. Uh, you know, the, the real, I'll say, challenge between the commercial world and the, and the, and the free software community, it, the tension really came with the focus uh, uh, on the GPL, you know, 12 years ago. Uh, because Stallman's goal when he created that license was in fact to neuter the idea that there was any commercial software. And, you know, and, and so that really made it a lot more di difficult because it, not only did it tend to prohibit people who wanted to take it and build a commercial derivative from doing so directly, but it took any commercial company who, who basically was doing anything else, it prohibited them in practice from taking the stuff because the license required in combination that you give up all your rights to your own product. And so, you know, I think that that, that one thing and the, and the areas it was applied to, you know, made the tension higher than it had been for decades. And because, you know, that particular operating system was popular, you know, it, it you know, it's, it, 
it's an area where the tension persists. But I think in other areas where people are, are using more like the traditional BSD license uh, and, and, you know, the dozens of other, you know, ones that people use, I think that there's a, a happy coexistence long term between people who want to be in the business of selling software, you know, for value and, and people who say, look, I'm happy to contribute my work for nothing. Thanks. Yes, sir. Last question. All right. So, I mean, we, you've shown us a bunch of amazing technologies here and you've said there are like 200 more currently under development at Microsoft Research, but obviously you have to pick just a few if you want people to actually be able to naturally interact with their computers. So, I mean, I guess over your 20 years of heading Microsoft Research, how did you make that decision that, okay, this is a cool thing in the lab, but I think it could change the world and I think we should push it forward to consumers? Well, it turns out when you look at these assets, the, in my mind, the, the first thing you have to do is decide what the scale of their impact is potentially. Some of the things, you know, can be very powerful, but, but they're in a very narrow domain of application. And so that's one natural filter you can apply in terms of, you know, you don't want to put a huge amount of effort beyond something that may be great, but it has a limited field of applicability. Uh, the other thing that, that we try to focus on uh, is whether we can integrate things. I mean, one of the greatest achievements of the company recently, and, and certainly Microsoft Research, was Connect, which was the, you know, sound and vision sensor for Xbox and, and now for other applications. And the, you know, at least to this point, despite its popularity, you know, nobody else has actually cloned a Connect. And you say, well, why is that? And the answer is because all of the key technologies, and there were multiple of them, there were like seven different classes of technology that came out of MSR, all were done at MSR. And while you could go around the world and find people who were working in each of the seven different areas, you couldn't find any one place where people understood how to make those things come together. And, th and that doesn't mean they won't eventually, but so when we look at things that are in an important area and where we have multiple ones that tend to reinforce each other, you know, that's an area that we tend to put more of an investment in too, uh, because it provides both novelty and some sustainable uniqueness, uh, simply because it's not one thing that has to be copied, it's many simultaneous breakthroughs that have to be copied. And, uh, and that, that's, you know, an, an advantage. And then the, the last is, is I'll, I'll say, guided by some high level, you can say, guesses as to what these major trends are going to be. So, for example, uh, it was, I want, I want to say, five or six years ago where I think I actually coined the term NUI. And I said, look, you know, the, People had talked about natural language and that kind of stuff, but you looked at what we were doing and everybody else had done, and all we were doing was sort of emulating these human senses one at a time and then using it as an alternative way to operate the graphical interface. And, and I said, no, I think that, that there is going to be a qualitative difference if we could actually start to think of natural interaction and applications designed around that as a whole thing. And by Raising that up, you know, then a certain set of things in MSR that tended to, you know, align with that as a, as a, I'll call it a corporate objective, sort of tend to rise up with it and you get reinforcement. The same thing happened with machine learning. You know, we said, look, this is, this is going to be a critical technology. We're going to use it in virtually every part of the business. And so, you know, you, you look around and you basically collect those things and, and, and give them some reinforcement. So, a lot of times, at least at my level, it's not picking a project over another project. It's basically picking these sort of macro directional statements that you think are going to produce a qualitative change across the company or across the industry, and then giving Rashid and the people who run research, you know, the, the, the mandate to some extent to take their big asset base and try to coalesce it in order to accelerate our capability in that specific area. So I think that would be how I would give you a direction there. Oh, thank you very much. Yep.
Well, thank you to everyone. I guess uh, we want to thank you, Craig, for coming and giving us a fabulous demonstration. We appreciate it.